Hello and welcome to the Action Lab Social Work Pathways Initiative second PhD information session. Today's panel um, will focus on the pathways to the PhD. In particular, that really uh, mysterious PhD application process. <laughs> um, and I'm Ovita Williams, Executive Director of the Action Lab at Columbia University School of Social Work and a lecturer. I'm excited to hear from our moderator, TNI Ren, who will introduce our illustrious panel of students and faculty to share their experience with applying to doctoral programs and all you ever wanted to know but didn't know who to ask or where to find out. That's the purpose of our time today. We have over 80 people registered for today's events from many parts of the country, if not around the world. I hear there are alumni on, there are folks who are current students. I'm in New York City and would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral unceded territory of the Lenape Nation on which we are here and teaching and learning and organizing. Thank you for choosing to attend today's discussion and I know you will leave with great information as you consider your own pathways to a doctorate degree. The Action Lab for Social Justice is a student-driven center at Columbia University committed to uprooting anti-Black racism and all forms of oppression through education, practice, and research. With love, care, and community at the core of the Action Lab's mission, students and faculty advisors are reaching for equity and liberation for all. So today, funded through the New York Community Trust, the Social Work Pathways Initiative creates opportunities for Black, Indigenous, people of color, students who experience economic vulnerability to complete their MSW and potentially their PhD if that's the pathway that they're on. So we're excited that we have this opportunity to provide this platform to share more information, to be able to uh, educate folks, particularly around um, what that doctorate path looks like. I want to introduce graduating MSW student TNI Wren and thank TNI for organizing this event, inviting the amazing panel, and for her commitment to creating a platform for people to share their wisdom and experiences for all of you today. TNI Wren is a second year MSW student and research intern at the Action Lab. She's leading a research project currently exploring factors that promote cross-racial solidarity among different communities of color. TNI is thrilled to be here and excited to introduce our panelists. I also want to thank Action Lab coordinator and alum Erin Kim and our colleague Mary Downs for all your assistance in organizing today's event. Enough from me, I will turn it over to TNI Ren, our moderator for the Pathways to the PhD application process, and she will introduce our speakers. Thank you all, and I hope this is informative for, for all of you. Thank you so much, Dr. All. Um, I'm TNI. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our panel. And we have a really, really amazing list of folks coming here from uh, different timelines um, on their PhD journey. And I'm really excited to introduce them. So we have Dr. Charles Leia. Dr. Leia is an assistant professor of social work at Columbia University. He's, his research focuses on educational um, equity among young black men and boys at risk and involved in the juvenile legal system. And he also he's also interested in health equity among formerly incarcerated young adult black men and the implementation and dissemination of culturally grounded education and community-based health prevention and treatment programs. Uh, through this work, Dr. Leia aims to develop knowledge and build theories that inform racially just and liberatory policies, practices, and interventions that can promote healthy development among young Black men and boys and lessen their risk for health compromising behaviors, arrest, incarceration, and recidivism. Dr. Leia's research is informed by his practice experience with racial and ethnic minor minoritized young people in the community, educational, and correctional settings. 
prior research on re-entry, school reform, and workforce, and youth development policies, programs, and practices, and training in qualitative methodology and community-based participatory research. Dr. Alea uh, received his PhD in social welfare from the University of California, Los Angeles, and has MSW from the University of Michigan and Bachelor in Sociology from the University of Berkeley, sorry, California, Berkeley. And let's have a warm welcome for Dr. Alea. And I'm gonna move on to our next panelist. Dr. He uh, Heidi Allen, um, MSW, PhD is Associate Dean for Research and Associate Professor in the School of Social Work at Columbia University. Dr. Allen's research focuses on eliminating health disparities through evidence-based health policy and evolved from her clinical practice in mental health and emergency department social work. She spent several years working in state health policy, focusing on delivery system redesign and coverage expansions. Professor Allen was 2014 to 15 American Political Science Association Congressional Fellow in Health and Aging Policy, as well as a 2017, um, 2017 speaker at TEDMED. She is currently a commissioner on the Medicaid and Chip Payment and Access Commission, a non-resident fellow at the Urban Institute, and a contributing writer at the Millbank Quarterly. Dr. Allen is a first-generation college graduate. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. A Dr. Allen. Next, I'm going to uh, introduce Dr. Anil. Dr. Anil is a mother, artist, and youth advocate who is dedicated to supporting Black youth in cultivating loving and culturally affirmed realities where they can holistically thrive. She applies a multi-method transdisciplinary approach to identify the cultural, communal, and contextual influences that shape how Black youth make learning of themselves and their society, and engage in practice to promote joy, social justice, and personal and collective wellness. Across this work, she engages media and creativity as a tool to foreground and the, the lived realities and voices of Black youth. Core to Dr. Neal's work is the conviction that the brilliance and innovation of Black youth are essential to knowledge production and social transformation. She seeks to work in community with youth and the important figures in their lives to design research projects, policies, and programs that are grounded in a developmental science centering a holistic vision of Black humanity. Dr. Neal earned her MSW and PhD in social work and developmental psychology from the University of Michigan and Harvard. MBAs from in psychology and African American studies from the University of Maryland College Park. Let's give a warm welcome to Dr. O'Neill. And now I'm going to introduce um, our doctoral student, Nathan Aguilar. Na Nathan Aguilar, um, LCSW, as a PhD candidate at the Columbia School of Social Work. He is currently working on several research studies within the field of community-based gun violence intervention and prevention, and a project focusing on justice-involved adolescent decision-making. His dissertation focuses on the impact of gunshot survivorship on the family system and the continuous traumatic stressors that survivors and their family members experience. Nason's research is informed by nearly a decade of performing community and hospital-based violence interventions and clinical therapies with gang involved youth and gunshot, sur gunshot survivors in Chicago and Brooklyn. Let's give a warm welcome to Nathan. Lastly, we have our MS graduating MSW student, Jet, and also a very vocal member with the Action Lab. Jet is a second year AGPP student with a specialization in contemporary social issues. They will attend NYU's social work PhD program this coming fall, and they're excited to share any advice, assistance, and information they have to dis demystify and challenge gatekeeping within the PhD application process. They hope to pass along knowledge about the role of self and disclosure throughout the process and how we can work to undo the exclusion of those with marginalized identities in academia. The fundamental objective of JET's research is to understand the intersection of marginalization, health, and mental health, to create empirical and systematic interventions. Specifically, their research in interests include evidence and community-based practices on social and health inequities for LGBTQIA populations, 
and developing and evaluating culturally tailored interventions to decrease stigma and increase resilience and identify and and increase re resilience and identity pride for marginalized groups. And also understanding how macro level systems like racism, heterosexism, and cis norm so, sorry, cis norm normativity are determinants of mental health and well-being for individuals and groups. Let's give a warm shout out to Jet. And thank you all again for being here. Um, just like the last panel that we held um, uh, over the fall semester, by the way, recordings can be found available on YouTube. Uh, this is going to be a very casual conversation among the panelists, sharing, sharing your experiences, sharing what to do, what not to do. Um, yeah, and I'm going to give a, um, I'm going to give the stage to our panelists. All right. Um... Uh, thank you all um, for showing up. Thank you to the Action Lab for put, putting this together and thank you for uh, the panelists for the amazing work that they do. Um, I think I'm just gonna answer the first question and then people uh, can chime in. But um, I think the first question, how did you narrow down and choose the right program that you wanted to pursue? Um, so for me, it was about um, uh, really thinking about uh, mentorship uh, and kind of uh, advisors that I would uh, that share my research interests. So that's um, kind of what I went into um, when when looking at programs. Um, but also, uh, I tried my best to also um, think about potential advisors uh, and mentors outside of the social work program. Uh, people within sociology, anthropology, psychology, economics. Uh, public health, uh, any of these um, fields that I think are so uh, kind of needed um, when thinking about uh, gun violence and community violence. Um, so for me, that was, that was a big part of, of kind of like mentorship. Who do I connect with? Um, and then also like the practicality of like being a PhD program. I wanted to live. Uh, I moved here with my wife. So thinking about what employment opportunities um, would look like for her. And I think just a, a place where I feel like I could kind of build community as well within um, the institution and outside the institution. Um, so I think really considering kind of what type of person you are, um, how do you engage in kind of self-care and self-care practices, I think is an important component when thinking about um, a PhD program. I'm happy to chime in. Um, Again, thank you for the introduction. Grateful to be um, a part of this wonderful panel with all these amazing scholars. Um, so for me, an important part of pursuing a PhD program is identifying what you're passionate about, what you care about, and what skills you need in order to um, pursue those kind of options. Um, I actually initially was, I was trained by psychologists and so for me in the beginning, actually most of the programs that I applied for were actually psychology programs, particularly clinical psychology programs, because I knew I wanted to have clinical skill sets in order to best support my uh, community. I didn't necessarily feel as if I wanted to be a full-time therapist, but I wanted to have the capacity to be licensed and have those clinical skills. So I applied to mostly clinical programs, but then um, found the joint program uh, in psychology and social work at the University of Michigan, and it just felt amazingly in alignment with my interests, but particularly because um, I was able to do all the coursework and requirements of development of psychology and have that lens. Because I, I focus, my work focuses on adolescence, right? So having that theoretical lens, understanding of the processes that shape the well being of adolescents was helpful. And then coupling that with a clinical kind of perspective that was more oriented towards social change, right? What are the social systematic structures that contribute to the lives of adolescents? How do we start to think about the applications of work that applies this developmental theory to, you know, to impact? Um, and so my program was joint. And so I got a clinical, I got an MSW okay, with an interpersonal practice. But then the research side of things was, you know, I got the PhD, which allowed me to um, delve more into scholarship that was oriented towards social justice and social change. Um, and so for me, it was definitely um, have, 
the, the, in the back of my mind, as I was thinking about PhD programs, a, good, a most important piece was like, what do I need to do? Like, what do I need to have? What skills do I need to have to do the mission, to do the work that I'm interested in um, as I was, you know, at, when I leave this program? And then the second piece that's incredibly important is who's going to support me? So I think a difference between like a master's level program and a PhD program is that uh, the mentorship is very important. A lot of PhD programs have kind of like a, um, uh, I can't think of the word, I don't know why, <laughs> but essentially someone is supporting you and guiding you through it. It's, it's very specialized, right? So the goal, a goal of a PhD is to have specialized knowledge. And so having faculty who have work, it doesn't have to be exactly what you do or what you're, exactly what you're interested in, but has work that complements your interests that can provide you with that specialized training is important, particularly having multiple people. Um, so sometimes in some programs, you might find someone you're like, yo, this person is great. They do exactly what I wanna do. I'm passionate about their work and I feel like it's gonna help me or, you know, but then what happens if that person leaves, right? Are there other scholars that you can tap into in that department that will also be supportive in, in your training? Um, so those kind of things were important. It's like, do I have multiple people here that support me? Will this program give me the skill sets that are important and applicable to what I want to do in the future? I think that similarly building off that, my um, my first my first thought how I was um, how I was starting to narrow down all the programs was geography, um, cost of living, um, and funding for programs. Um, so those were my big three and some of the non negotiables that um, I built into my planning process. Um, Obviously, this was very recent. I just just finished my my process and will be attending next year. But um, in addition to to mentorship and contacting for professors and seeing who would be a good match, uh, who does similar research to me, and making sure, like you were saying, like having multiple people that do similar research to to my own or who can like multiple mentors that can support me. As I don't think anyone's PhD should be built around one person because you never know if tenure is going to happen. You never know if their life is going to change. Um, so I really made sure I had a minimum of three professors that I knew that um, on a research level I would vibe with, um, I would uh, and could support me in the in the research I wanted to do. Um, and a large thing for me was uh, ability to be myself. Um, I had applied to some schools um, that I didn't know if I could be an openly trans person. Um, I didn't know if I could be an openly first gen PhD student. Um, I, I didn't know how I, uh, a lot of these uh, issues until I talked with folks and um, got in or started getting into the, um, the funding of the program and trying to figure out the culture of the school. So um, I made a list of these non-negotiables um, and, you know, narrowed it down by state and cost of living and um, funding opportunities um, and safety for um, my own self. And the last thing I did was uh, I didn't just apply to social work programs. I applied to public health and public welfare programs um, and including Dartmouth's uh, health policy and clinical practice program, which I think is public health technically. Um, so uh, making sure that the program, even at its core, at, it, at what it's training you on um, can can get you where you want to go. So like you were saying earlier, know your passions um, and know what you want to do. Um, and if you don't, that's okay, because you can figure it out during the program. But um, having having some some concrete ideas of where you want to go. I'll also um, just kind of add to what folks are saying. Um, in addition to, you know, for me and thinking about the mentors or advisors, as well as opportunities across universities, I also thought about the city the schools were located in. Um, now looking back, I realize that like, you know, committing to a doctoral program is a huge part of or aspect of your life. It takes a lot out of you and it requires a lot from you. Um, and so for me, being able to be in a city, one where I could do the research with populations I was interested in, um, but to also have community within and outside of um, the university setting was was really critical um, just because um, when it gets hard, it's it's good to have community and people um, that you trust and that you know um, to help you through the process. And so that was a huge um, aspect for me. I know I didn't want to be in a rural remote area far away from family and things like that. And so um, I made sure that there were, I was in a city that um, 
or at least thought about, you know, applying to schools that were in cities that um, I could see myself living for a long amount of time. So out of the panel, I uh, applied the farthest back in time, <laughs> um, uh, but I still remember it well. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, like zero idea. Um, I, I didn't have uh, anybody walk me through it. I didn't know anybody who had gotten a PhD um, that I could felt comfortable asking. Uh, so I did none of the things that anybody has talked about. I applied to the school that was in my town. It was the only school um, and it had, it's where I got my master's in social work. So it was a school that I knew and, and I was waitlisted uh, until like a week before school started. They, <laughs> I feel like they must have gone way down on the list. And finally, a week before school, they're like, hey, do you still want to come? And I was like, yes. And so there I was. Um, but there was so much that I wish that I had known. And, and I see that reflected in the advice that's already been put out there. Like, I didn't know to research uh, the faculty and and find people who were interested in the same things I'm interested in. And, and I felt that because as soon as I was in my PhD program, I realized that I already knew more about my topic than any of the faculty that was in the program. And that, that was tough because I didn't have, I wasn't being pushed. I didn't have, uh, I didn't know the right methodologies for studying my topic. I was health policy and there were no health policy people there. And so I wasn't using the right tools for studying health policy. Um, so I would say, you know, apply to a lot of programs, um, research them well. Uh, all the advice about finding people and multiple people that are in your area, I think is really helpful. Um, the other thing I didn't know is, is the difference between assistant and associate and professors of practice and lectures. And I, I, so I didn't really know, even if I had done it back then, I wouldn't have known kind of who was a permanent member of the community who is adjunct and probably not taking PhD students. So understanding that uh, people who are in the tenure track who are have the title assistant professor may or may not stay at the school. Um, you can kind of get a sense of, of how long they've been there, um, uh, sometimes by when they started. That associate professor usually means that they have tenure. Um, that a full professor means that they might be edging towards retirement. Um, that a profession, a profession, a professor of professional practice often means that they have like a very specific clinical skill that they bring to that, and they are a permanent member of the, co the community. Um, trying to understand those kind of things, I think, would have been really helpful to understand, you know, who might be potential mentors. Um, the other thing that I didn't know that I really wish I had known is that you shouldn't apply to the school that you want to end up at. So I wanted to be a professor at Portland State University. I, I had a community in Portland. I love Portland. And I applied for my, my PhD program at Portland State University. And then when I graduated, I was like, so how do I become a professor here? And they were like, oh, like you don't, <laughs> you have to go somewhere else. And, and maybe someday you could come back, but not for a long time. And, and that, and because my, the town I wanted to live in the town where my community was, that was the only program that meant that I have not been able to, I had to leave my community and I haven't been able to return to it. Um, and I really wish that I had known that. Um, and I wish that I would known that if you get multiple offers that sometimes you can leverage that for funding. So if you have two or three schools that all want you, then you can start asking them about their financial aid package. And sometimes you can do a little bit of negotiation, which I think is really helpful. And then the last thing I, I, I didn't pay for my PhD, but had they told me I needed to, I would have, because I didn't know that most of the time that you don't have to pay for your PhD. So if you're applying to a program or a type of PhD where they want you to pay tuition and they don't offer you uh, tuition remission and a stipend, then you should stop and, and think about that because that's a lot of debt to graduate with. Um, so those are the things that I wish that I would have known. Thank you so much all for sharing. So we are going to move on to the second uh, question, which is what is the tentative timeline of preparing for the application starting from spring to now to fall look like for you? I think that for me, um, I feel like maybe um, if I was applying in December, 
that I would, um, that I started the process maybe around January or maybe February of the previous year. Um, and I think for me, what, what's best is to kind of talk with people. Um, so I reached out to um, all the potential advisors um, that I was looking at for potential schools, just like a cold email, um, just kind of sharing uh, that, that I'm interested in being an applicant and would just, you know, we wonder if they had um, 15 to 20 minutes to kind of just talk about their work, uh, the program, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I did that. Uh, so that was my first process of just reaching out to advisors. And then uh, I would also reach out to PhD um, students and candidates within the program as well, just to hear from kind of their perspective, what they thought um, about the program. Um, so for me, it, it really started um, maybe like 10, 10 months before, just kind of trying to um, get a, uh, build a relationship with, with, with a faculty member or, or students there. Um, and then it kind of went into studying for the GRE um, and then, um, yeah, uh, getting letters of rec, um, writing my personal statement. But yeah, I probably started about like 10, uh, 10 months early um, before applying. Yeah, I would agree. I think um, my process started about 10 months to a year before as well, because um, I mostly started with like an Excel spreadsheet of all the schools that I was considering and looked at their previous applications to see what types of questions they asked on personal statements that would help me to at least just draft a general statement before. But I also use that as an opportunity to identify faculty. And, and this also helped me to narrow my focus as well, um, because, yeah, while it's great to know people who study these things and do well, um, a big question I always had, well, you know, that's great, but can I work with this person? Um, and oftentimes having those 20 to 30 minute meetings, you know, via Zoom or if you can meet in person can give you an idea if you really want to spend the next several years committing to work with someone who you really can't really work with. And so um, I would say my timeline was about the same and I, I really tried to draft those statements early, um, typically either in the spring or early summer so that I had time to share with other people um, so that I could get feedback early. Um, and especially it's important to have those if you're looking to seek out letters of rec from folks. So at least you can share that and they have some idea about what it is you're hoping to study and, and why. I'm trying, to remember. I'm trying to remember my timeline. Um, <laughs> it was a while ago, but um, I similarly, I think I did take a long time, about a year. I don't think that you have, like, if folks are like, oh, I'm, I'm trying to apply now or I'm looking into it and I haven't started, I don't think it's impossible to do that, right? Like, I think there's still, um, opportunities to make your spreadsheet, as Charles mentioned, figure out who the folks are that you're interested in applying. Um, you can reach out to folks and ask them if they're taking students. Um, I think a key piece is making sure that you have a supportive mentorship. Um, like who, are, who would be your letter writers would be my thought. Like, do you have research experience? That's actually really, really critical for a PhD program is having some skills and research experience and having strong letters. And so talking to the letter writers would be helpful in figuring out where to apply potentially, because they'll know your interests, you know, um, if you're at a good stage in terms of like, do you have what you need in order to apply? Um, and, you know, ensuring that you have their support so you know that you have, you know, the three letters that you need, which is usually what folks need for these kind of programs. So I think that you can absolutely, if you're, if you have the capacity to start early, the earlier is the earlier the better. So at least explore and figure out where I want to go, what kind of program, who's there. But um, if, for 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 instance, you're interested, you're in applying now, and you haven't started the process for the fall, I think it's still possible to do that, just to ensure that you are in communication with those who are mentoring you um, to make sure that you are prepared. In addition, I think a disadvantage of like reaching out to people, for instance, in, in the fall about the following year is that so much changes, you know, in a year, right? So someone might be changing institutions, somebody might decide they are taking students or not taking students. You really don't know too far in advance, um, but nevertheless, the point is you should start early if you can. If you haven't started early, then I think if you haven't started a year ago, you know, a year in advance, I think there is still room for you to um, pursue it. I'd like to echo that. Um, I definitely didn't get started a year in advance. Um, 
and not in not in uh, indecisiveness or um, you know I think it was actually in fear um, of fear of the process and the unknown and um, going to you know the the demystifying PhD um, last program of this panel um, happened and I still felt really unsure um, but I think that when I got started, the first thing I did was identify the schools. I updated this, my CV um, and I, uh, including all of the research that I'm currently working on that always looks good under the, um, in, um, that are like, that are the, uh, your publications that are underway, or if there's anything you're working on, just making sure that gets all set there. Um, I wanna also emphasize the importance of emailing faculty. I spent a really long time um, going through papers of faculty that I felt were really important um, and that I wanted to work with. Each email that I drafted was obscenely, not long, but really detailed. So they knew that I was actually really interested in their work and that our, our work does overlap. Um, and the amount of spreadsheets I had was overwhelming. So um, I, I think that getting organized can really help you if you don't get started uh, you know, a year or 10 months in advance, um, just keeping yourself organized um, and also asking for help. That was the only reason I was able to do that. Um, thank you, Dr. O for <laughs> writing my recommendation, um, but it's also like making sure you have those folks um, that are available and I'm sure we'll be sharing our emails at the end of this. So. I would say, uh, so I didn't do any of those things because once again, I had no idea what I was doing um, and I, pieced it together last minute. But um, I, I would say if you're currently in your master's program, that there's some really key things that you can do right now that will help prepare you for that timeline. And that's one, actually get to know the professors that you would like to be your recommendators, uh, letter recommendation writers. It's I get lots of emails from students wanting letters of recommendations for PhD programs. But if I never really talked to them, if they didn't meet with me outside of class, uh, all I really can often do, or, or if they didn't speak a lot in class, it was, re it's really hard sometimes to, to, to be able to say anything other than this is what my class is about. This is the grade that they got, you know, it represents excellent work, that kind of thing. But if you take time to have a couple of meetings with them and just chat with them, I think that that really helps them remember you and helps you remember them. Um, getting opportunities to do independent studies with faculty that really helps uh, or do research or volunteer in some way so that you get to know the, the, the professor that is so important and allows them to really personalize their letter to you and speak about what you really bring would, or would bring to the program or your area of research. Um, the other thing that I didn't do that I wish I had done is, you know how you turn in your big final paper <laughs> and then you get feedback and then the the year ends and you go off into summer in your life and you forget about it. Um, you have to provide a writing sample for your PhD application. And I wish that I would have at the end of the semester taken that paper, read all of the feedback, implemented the feedback right then and there, rewrote the paper. So I had a polished paper for my writing sample. Um, because if you try to look back a year later, two years later, what feedback you've gotten, it's sometimes hard and you're out of you know touch with the paper. It's hard to make those changes. So just think of like, even though you're not going to turn it into anybody, that you pick one paper that is your writing sample paper and you follow it all the way through. I think that that's really helpful. Um, and then others have said this, but I just really want to underscore it. Your essays should be reviewed by no no fewer than like two or three people, like ha reviewed multiple, multiple times. Like you're sick of it, they're sick of it, but it really is so key. Um, I spend the most time when I'm reviewing applications with the essays um, because it tells me so much about a person. And so really making sure that you've gotten those right. And, and one of the, the things I see people do all the time is they, they, for, they don't quite answer the questions because they're trying to create some master essay that they use across applications. And so it doesn't quite fit or they'll put the wrong faculty's name in the application or the wrong school. Um, those kind of like those things are small, but it kind of shows that you're, you know, rushing, that you're not putting that seriousness of purpose into the application. So the really, the little details really matter. You know, for our PhD program at Columbia, we get like over a hundred applications. We take, you know, five or so students 
it's so competitive that you really kind of have to try to hit every every part of it uh, really well. Of course, that's not true of all programs. This is an exceptionally competitive program. Um, and I also recommend applying to, you know, like a dream school uh, and then the schools that you'd be happy with and not not having all of your applications in the like the school that like accepts three to five percent applications because that's just really hard. Thank you all so much for sharing. Um, we're um, so the last question is, um, do you have any tips or things that you wished you knew about writing research proposals and personal statements? I know that Dr. Allen already touched upon that um, earlier. So I want to see if anyone else might have some thoughts on this. Yeah, I think for me, I, I think I could have done a better job of um, tailoring my um, like re research proposal um, towards um, uh, some of the faculty. Uh, I think I was kind of general um, in my, and in, 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 in kind of explaining what I wanted, wanted to do. And I think if I, I think um, just looking back, I, I think my application or my, my um, proposal would have been stronger had I kind of tailored it towards um, specific um, works of advisors uh, or faculty at that specific school. Um, so I think looking back, I, I wish I would have um, just provided a little bit more detail around uh, that end for myself. I wish that um, there was someone who had told me that I can be radical in my personal statement. I don't like the word radical because I think that it should be part, like what I wrote about should be part and of, of social work. Um, but I, I chose to disclose some um, personal things about myself and I used it in how I believed was a powerful way. Um, I wish that someone had told me if I do that and you get rejected, it's gonna hurt and it's gonna be really hard to not take it personally. Um, however, it does work and you know, you, utilizing it and showing that you can frame yourself and um, acknowledge your positionality within a personal statement and where you stand in your research and why you want to go to that school and why you would be good for that school. Um, I think that um, there were a couple of folks who told me I shouldn't do it um, and I did it anyway um, and it worked out because I, it showed me the programs that actually have my values and who would want to take me after they know me in a personal statement. I didn't hold back though it's terrifying um, I can't say that it was easy, um, but I do think that it was one of the things that um, set me apart. Um, and it took forever. It took forever to get my myself on a page. Um, and and some some schools did uh, only like 1,200 words, right? Um, some were different. But I think that the personal statement and utilizing your positionality and your sense of self was really powerful and also showing what like, can be a driving factor as to why you want to pursue the research you want to do if it's an identity or stigma or, or prejudice. Um, so I, I just think that was the biggest thing that I wish someone had told me. Reminding myself that there isn't a perfect statement. There's many ways you can write your statement, right? I think sometimes we get caught up in like, this is the answer and this is how you do it. Um, but yeah, there's absolutely, one, every application can vary um, in terms of what the content is, but there's an importance of just, of honoring yourself in the process um, and not being so caught up in perfectionism and that you lose sight of who you are as your kind of, and that's actually important in the whole program, right? Who are you? What do you believe? What are your values? How do you show up into the space as authentically you? Um, and not fitting into the box of what people say you should be. So there is, quote unquote, a recipe, right, for some of these applications in the sense that there are things that folks are looking for, um, but there isn't a perfect way to do it. I would agree. Um, just ensuring and making sure that you don't lose the personal aspect to the personal statement. Um, I think that's why it's called a personal statement. So like not being afraid of, you know, being honest and open about who you are and your experiences and how that shapes, you know, how and why you do the work you do. Um, I would say one of the major things is, I mean, I think with that is just really understanding that writing is a process. Um, 
and that you're going to go through many, many drafts. Um, um, and also that um, feedback is so critical. And so that means that, you know, really starting early and really, you know, asking people who can, who, who you trust to be able to provide you honest feedback about um, your writing as well. Um, and, and understanding that, you know, this is another opportunity for people to assess your writing abilities. Um, because as an academic, if that's the pathway you go from a PhD program, um, it's a lot of writing, you know, or in any other, you know, way. And so um, people are looking at, you know, your writing abilities and things like that. And so even if you, you know, can get folks to give you substantive feedback, or if even just having an editor, you know, review um, some of your writing, um, your grants or personal statements. Um, I think it's just really critical. And I think um, it helps you to become a stronger writer as you continue to move through the process of writing. Because uh, writing can be challenging and difficult, um, but use, you know, whatever tools that you can to really think about how do you really tell the story of, of who you are and how that shapes what your research is and looks like. Uh, we have a lot of really good questions for you. So do you need to know exactly what your research focus is before you apply? I don't think you need to know your specific research question. I think that that changes a lot over time. I think you need to know like the population and issue that you care about. Um, so for me, I was interested in access to care for low income people. Um, and health disparities related to insurance. But in terms of like what that was going to look like and how that shaped my you know, research, all of that kind of evolves throughout your program, but you need to be able to speak well to a problem um, and, and, and speak well to why you care about that issue. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen, for sharing. Um, so we also have questions regarding um, uh, can you speak to considerations around uh, NA, NA, uh, sorry, NIH funding when selecting a thematic area or program? I think I can speak to funding generally um, because there's, depending on the program, there's still multiple sources of funding. I mean, I think the biggest thing for programs is, and Heidi um, kind of alluded to this, is they should be, funding is important. You need to survive, right? Like you need to, to be able to take care of yourself and be healthy and well. And most top programs have funding for, mo for if not the whole program for multiple years. So it's important to be thoughtful and considerate about what the funding structure is, how you'll be supported, what the summer support looks like. Um, in terms of external funding, so there's internal and external, right? Internal funding often is like the university providing funding. There could be, or your program providing funding. And there might also be like a university additional scholarship or fellowship you can apply for beyond what your program applies for. And then there's also external funding opportunities. Often folks apply for those when they already start the program. Um, so that could be the National Science Foundation. That could be the um, health, um, I'm trying to think about the uh, Robert Wood Johnson Fellowship. And there are um, NIH, someone else can speak to this better because I'm not an NIH expert here, but there's additional funding that you can apply for um, or you know, might have supplements to, su to help support you. Um, so the biggest thing is how well-funded is the program by itself, right? And then are there also um, support, is there support in maybe potentially accessing external funding? But I think that focusing on what the program's funding structure looks like would be important. But I wonder if one of my colleagues- I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump as my, in my role, the Associate Dean for Research and thinking about how people get funding for their career. Um, Cause I read the, I heard the question slightly different. I heard it more like, should you pick a topic that nobody's funding or is it important to pick a topic that NIH funding that I like, I like your answer in Kemke though, because like focusing on the program's willing to, willingness to support you through these four or five years that you're gonna be doing a PhD program is super important. And, and, and knowing that there's lots of opportunities while you're in the program to get uh, funding to both support you and further training and your research is really important. Um, I would not be dissuaded by picking a research area that NIH isn't funding because NIH is, like they, they don't fund a lot of like gun violence research. And we know that gun violence matters. Um, there's a lot of areas that the NIH has not been very active in that really, really matters. 
but I would look to see, are there other funders out there that are interested in supporting that research? Because if you pick an, an area that's so esoteric that there's nobody out there that seems to be funding it, either you're so far ahead of the curve that you have to kind of hope that the world catches up with you, or you're going to probably struggle to try to get innovative work funded. So, um, but, you know, I study healthcare policy. We often, we do get NIH funding all the time, but sometimes we're trying to do things that are quicker. And so we look for foundation funding. So I look and make sure that like there's a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, there's the Commonwealth Fund, there's the Smith Richardson Foundation. You, you, if you can see those things out there, then I think that you're pretty much uh, set. Uh, it doesn't matter as much if NIH is funding. However, if there is alignment between you and NIH's interests, then that is great because there are some uh, funding that could be available to you even when you are a pre-doctoral student and when you become a doctoral student. Thank you all so much for answering that. Uh, our next question, and it's um, a bit of a three-part question. So um, should we be worried if we haven't done any formal research prior to applying? Is it worth applying if you aren't published or aren't working on research currently? And the follow-up is, um, uh, is how to get into or be a part of research after MS and if And uh, if you can still be a competitive applicant with minimum research experience? I can speak on the, um, the, 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 the piece about like gaining research opportunities. Um, so yeah, so, so for me, yeah, my, my interest has always kind of been gun violence. And so I knew that, um, you know, uh, after kind of um, four or five years of practice that I wanted to, um, you know, uh, pursue a PhD. And so, uh, yeah, I, I just kind of honestly just started to uh, just reach out to like uh, PhD students or even like um, professors who are doing similar work. And yeah, I would just kind of ask them if they had, um, if they needed kind of any support in, in various research projects. And I think that was beneficial because it, it, it helped me kind of get letters of recommendation, but also um, I can kind of speak about um, some research that I'm currently doing. Uh, within kind of my field of interest. So I, I, I wouldn't hesitate to, yeah, just just reach out, um, speak with people who are doing kind of work that you're interested in. And, and I think just, just asking um, kind of what capacity they might have um, uh, for you to kind of jump on some of those projects. Um, so I, I can really speak to that piece. I'm not too confident about the other pieces though. I can say that it was definitely beneficial for me to have um, or currently be working on some research projects. Um, I think kind of going off what you were saying, Nathan, is that the um, like creating these opportunities for yourself if they don't arise is really important. At the same time, I do feel like there, if you are if you are dedicated and if you show that you have the capacity to under, undertake research, I don't think that it means that you can't apply. I, I think that like don't ever let people tell you that because you can be competitive. Um, that being said, I'm not the, the expert, nor am I on a doctoral committee um, reading applications. So perhaps I should pass it off to uh, Dr. Allen. Um, but that's just my perspective as someone who just applied and heard about some other folk. I would say it's pretty hard to be competitive at one of the very top schools if you have no research experience. I doesn't mean it's impossible, but I think it's really tough because they have to find ways to distinguish applicants. Um, but I think that the reason why isn't what you would expect. Um, the reason why if I would be hesitant to accept somebody without research experience at Columbia PhD program is I would be sure if you understood what a PhD program is. So particularly in social work, we get a lot of applicants who what they really want is an advanced clinical degree. Um, and there are some of those in social work um, where people go and it's, it's just more advanced training in clinical practice, but we are a PhD in research. And, and if you don't, haven't done research, then I think the question is, is how do you even know you like it? <laughs> and you might show up and you might hate it. You might be like, this is the most boring, tedious, terrible thing. And we don't want to bring anybody into the program that we think uh, might not be sure that they know what they're getting themselves into. So if you've done research with people, then you know that it can be at times very tedious and boring. Um, and you kind of know what it is that you're committing to. So for that reason, I think it's good to get good, some research experience before you apply. 
Thank you so much all. Um, I want to move on to the next question is how did folks um, and how do folks uh, afford to do the PhD and support themselves at the same time? Um, I made sure that they have TA shifts, so teaching, uh, teaching, teaching assistantships and research and research assistantships available um, because you can do that as fund as extra funding or an extra job. Um, there's usually a 20 like at NYU, there was a 20 hour a week research practicum for the fellowship, um, but we can get another research assistantship outside of that. I will say that not all schools will allow you to do a teaching assistantship and a research assistantship. Unfortunately, Columbia doesn't allow that. So um, I added that into my consideration. Um, but so, and to making sure that those other opportunities are there and outside funding are available as well. Yeah, and I would add sometimes too, um, depending on who your mentors or advisors um, are, they might have ongoing research where they could hire you as a research um, assistant on one of their ongoing projects. And so that could fund you in some way um, and support you. Um, for me, um, while I was in my doctoral program, I often had jobs outside of the school, primarily doing research related things, just because it was easier to have like a flexible schedule so that I had time to focus on schoolwork and projects that I was working on with school, but also um, I had an opportunity to do other things outside, whether that was teaching at another local university or, you know, supporting a, a small research project um, that was outside of the school. Yeah, there generally are rules about how much you can be employed within the university. Um, and what type of employment you can have when you're a PhD student. So you should check on that um, because then even if a faculty member has money to fund you, sometimes that just replaces money that the school was using to fund you. So you don't actually see any increase in salary. So that's really important to understand those policies. I worked full-time during my PhD program and it was terrible, terrible, terrible. Do not recommend. Um, and I also took out student loans, which uh, in retrospect, turned out to be fine because I got a loan repayment program through the NIH that helped me pay off my student loans. But if that had not happened, it would have been a pretty terrible burden. Um, so I think, you know, that is an option, but I would, you know, consider it carefully. Um, and ideally, you try to find a program that pays you enough to live where you're at while you're in the program. Yeah, I would agree. Just being thoughtful about the cost of living is important um, in terms of what the stipend support looks like. So you might have, you know, there's such variation on what stipend support can look like in a program. Um, but, um, you know, a program might give you a lot of money, but it's like, what's the cost of living? Talking to other grad students um, before you start to get a feel for how they're managing that stipend. I think for me, it was definitely different because I came straight from undergrad into the PhD program. And I didn't have money. Um, I didn't have a real job before, so I was like, oh, I actually can provide for myself to an extent, and I was in an area where the cost of living was low, but I would also say that um, external funding can be helpful, um, as, but as Heidi mentioned, it really varies across the institution, but, you know, sometimes if you get external funding, you can get some bumps in your um, stipend, and sometimes if you have multiple offers, PhD programs, some programs are willing to negotiate increases in stipend as well. Um, so just having an understanding of what the policies are and ensuring that you are, um, um, you know, what the cost of living is before you get into that space. Thank you all so much for these amazing advice. Um, and I want to be mindful of time. So I think we have time for maybe one more question and we'll have to uh, move on. Um, so, uh, so one of the, uh, uh, sorry. So some of the audiences are uh, wondering if, um, and what's your advice for students who are considering PhD, but aren't sure if they have narrowed down an area that would be robust enough for a PhD program, and or if the passion area or idea is better suited for something else. Um, who did you speak to guidance? Um, who did you speak to um, to get guidance and feedback from before applying for a PhD? Um, I'm going to have to run, so I'll just answer this quickly. Um, I, a part of it, this comes back to the beauty of having research mentors um, and having research experience before you go into the program. Even if you have an idea, it does, it often changes. Some people change complete areas while they're in their doctoral program, but having guidance from someone as you're even crafting your question to determine, okay, is it too broad? For instance, sometimes people say, I just, I care about mental health of adolescents. I'm like, okay, cool, but what does that mean? 
right? There's like being having some specificity is important and you won't really know like the level of specificity you need until you kind of have that guidance from someone who has a PhD who's, who is doing research. So I think um, speaking to your professors and you know you have professors who are uh, research oriented and the research mentors can help guide you in like the scope of what you're trying to study um, and help you narrow the focus um, of the work. And you'll probably change. Like most people come in thinking they want to do something and then it evolves as they meet new people and learn new things. And so don't feel like you have to have it all figured out. We don't expect that every person who says they're going to do this is going to be doing that by the time they graduate. Um, I think what you're they're really looking for is, is there something that you really care about, that you're curious about, that um, has a lot of meat that you can dig into? Um, and I think that we expect that that your thinking on things will change as you as you learn because you, you're coming in and you're just going to delve right in and you're going to learn so much and your and your uh, interests will evolve. Thank you all so much. Um, so we are at one o'clock. Um, I'm going to pass on to Dr. O to. Uh... Wow, this is so incredible. I want to thank everyone. T and I thank you for moderating this incredible conversation. Uh, to Nkemka and Charles and Jet, Nathan, Heidi, um, your wealth of information was fantastic. We're going to have more of these events because there's just so many questions um, that we didn't get to. We're going to save the questions and be able to offer another panel, another event, or another way of sharing information to you all. Um, and I'm going to just speak with my colleagues here. Is it okay for people to reach out to you? <laughs> Speaking about mentorship, these are the people you need to be in touch with. Reach out to me, reach out to anyone on our panel. We, I'm more than happy, to, and I talk about with any student who's willing to, to, to ask me about the PhD process. Um, so thank you again. Have a great afternoon. And goodbye, everyone.